So today's case is a bank robbery that ends in murder. So we got two crimes here, uh, but the ultimate crime of taking somebody's life is going to be linked into the first crime. So what's important about this is to be able to tell the story in a chronological time span so that way you understand how the case is laid out and ultimately uh, who's responsible. So this crime happened in Noel, 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 Missouri. It's a population of less than a thousand, so it's a real small town. Uh, on October 6th, 1989, a bank employee shows up, notices that the door is unlocked, and when she enters, she sees the vault is wide open and there's some papers uh, strewn about you know obviously the bank has been robbed they try to get a hold of the bank uh, I'm not sure he's the bank president or the bank manager but his name is Dan Short now Dan's not answering his phone so there's some concern because there's only three people that know the combination or have keys to that vault two of them were accounted for but one is not so right off the bat as an investigator you know you're thinking mm, could this guy be involved let's learn more about him so you know right off the bat as an investigator you kind of want to dive into okay who is this Dan Short look at his victimology and you determine well he has just recently within I believe it was 18 months so maybe a year has separated from his wife that he had had for a long time he had been drinking a little bit uh, more than usual from the research that I did and that's not unusual I know many people who have gone through divorces and stuff and unfortunately they think that they have to you know solve their problem with the uh, imbibance of alcohol at a much more than normal level hey who am I to judge how somebody goes about solving their problems but I will say no matter how much you drink and how much you imbibe that night a problem will still be there in the morning so you learn this about Dan he is in charge of denying loans extending credit for the bank so in that managerial type of position you're going to create you know enemies it's just part of it especially you know when it comes to money people kill because of money greed jealousy rage and unfortunately he has to take the brunt of that if he has to deny somebody a loan deny somebody credit um, so your suspect pool, you know, if Dan cannot be found, is great. But we're still focusing on Dan and his position at the bank. Why is he not answering? Um, some more work has to be done. Well, what's the next step as an investigator? You're going to go to Dan Short's home. That's what they do. But when they get there, something ain't right. Where his vehicle normally sits, there is debris, like some lady, somebody had like brushed out his truck and left everything out there on the ground. 
Inside the house, his glasses that he wore all the time are there in the nightstand or dresser where he always kept them. House looks like it's ransacked. Maybe a struggle took place. Okay. Your spidey senses go up a little bit more. Okay, there's a bank robbery. This guy's stuff is out of whack. You know, in my mind, if I'm there, I still keep in the possibility, hey, Dan Short's still a suspect for this bank robbery. You know, he's gone. He has keys to the vault. But go back to the vault. And one of the bank personnel says, hey, there's a secret compartment. Yeah, you guys didn't know banks had that, right? So in the vault, there's a secret compartment that has $100,000 cash in it. It's still there. Dan knew about that. Okay, so if he was involved, why didn't he take that? Instead, the robbers took about $71,000 in cash, but they also took four thousand dollars worth of coin do you guys know how much four thousand dollars worth of coin weighs well i'll tell you it weighs 320 pounds so right there you can start deducing some things okay these guys are probably guys number one probably not female although there are plenty of female who can lift 320 pounds um it's a grueling endeavor going to probably take several trips so for me, I'd be looking for younger guys, younger males. That's about as far as you can deduce from there. And that in itself is not foolproof. You can't just narrow yourself on that. But in a general direction, that's what you can start thinking. So the evidence inside the bank. There was two spent shell casings, 45 caliber, on the bank floor. The security camera in the bank had been spray painted black and turned around. Now, what I would want to know is what that camera caught before it was spray painted. But apparently it didn't catch anything because there's no fingerprints. There's no suspects. The only evidence at the scene of the bank is two spent shell casings. Now, I would originally think right off the bat, okay, why is there two shell casings here? Where's the blood? Who got shot in the bank? Well, turns out nobody got shot in the bank. The robber or robbers shot the security camera. I, I find this very odd because you've already spray painted the security camera. You've already turned it around, but then you shoot it. That's how I understood this as I researched it. And if that's the case, you can start deducing some other things. Possibly there's some sort of anger involved here because you've already took care of the problem. Much like other crimes like overkill of a victim. Okay, let's say the offender shoots the victim in the head. They're dead. They're, they're, they're done. The crime is over. But yet, now the offender takes a knife and stabs them 15 times in the chest. That tells you something about the offender. It tells you that there's some sort of anger involved here. Because you're doing more than is necessary for the commission of the crime. Your goal is to kill this person. You've done that, but now you're taking extra steps. So go back to the bank vault. If the offender shot the same security camera that was spray painted and turned around, that's anger or that's amateur. That's what that tells me. Somebody that is not a sophisticated criminal. Now, if I came to find out later on that it was a second security camera, maybe that they didn't know about or didn't see, and it's capturing everything, and they shot it, okay, well, that's different. But I don't think that's the case here, because if that was the case, 
why they're doing everything else and they don't know about this camera back here behind me and then they see it and shoot it, it would still capture the footage, right? So I believe they shot the same camera that they already blacked out and that they already turned around. So I'm looking at somebody that's, I'm going to say younger, amateur, or had a lot of anger maybe towards the bank. And that could get you a lot of places because of Dan's position. So that's what we have. That's it. Not a lot to go on, right? Where's Dan Short? Well, the answer to that question would come five days later when a fisherman sees a body floating about 20 miles from where the crime occurred. The police are called in. What is very disturbing about this is he is identified as Dan Short because of identification in his clothing. But the disturbing aspect of this is that he was duct taped to a chair with chain hoist, a chain, and a cinder block. So before the medical examiner even gets there, he does an autopsy or anything, you're thinking, I know I would be thinking, whoa, was this guy thrown in the river alive like this? How terribly frightening that is, if that's the case. Well, lo and behold, medical examiner does autopsy and they find water in his lungs. What's that mean? That means he was breathing when he went in that water. Now, initial speculation was uh, that I researched was that there was no duct tape over his mouth. So the first assumption is he wasn't alive when he went in there or he was unconscious. Think back to uh, Natalie Wood. Uh, that's what this case kind of reminded me of. Not the case, but this specific medical examiner's autopsy um, and report. But if the mouth is not duct taped, you would think he would be screaming. And so that was the reasoning for them believing maybe he wasn't, um, he was dead or unconscious at the time. But the medical report refutes that and it says he was alive. Can you imagine that? I mean, you look at this bridge and the high railings that are on it. So this tells you something else. It tells me there's got to be two people involved. To lift a hundred and let's say 80 pound man that has a cinder block, a chain hoist, a chain on a chair up over that and throw him in. Not one person's going to do that. Possible, sure. Not probable. So now I'm looking at two individuals that are amateurs or angry at the bank. It so happens that a witness happened to see a brown van on that bridge that night. So let's say Dan, and I want you to ponder this because I thought about this. What if Dan Short, the victim, was not tied duct tape to a chair? What happens if his body was just found? You could say, some would say, he could still be a suspect in this robbery, right? He could have taken the money and then committed suicide. But, you know, that would be quickly debunked because why would a person that just got away with this money kill himself? So no matter how he is found, let's say he was found in a garage with a gun next to him and they wrote it a suicide. You can almost debunk that right away. I mean, you can't completely ignore it, but you can, per you can more or less say, hey, th that's not the case. This guy was murdered, okay? He's not going to rob a bank 
get all this money, abandon his truck somewhere else. I think I failed to mention that. They found his truck abandoned um, somewhere else, not next to the bridge. And he, sh he ends up dead. No, it's not suicide. So we now can get rid of Dan Short as a suspect for the bank robbery. And one could conclude that one crime has something to do with the other, right? The bank robbery, the bank robbery is connected to Dan Short's murder. So now where do you go? Well, now if there's not much forensic evidence, you have to start listening to witnesses and people are starting to call in. One of the calls says, hey, there's two brothers in town. Their name is Shannon and Joel Arg Argofsky, who are spending a lot of money and they don't have jobs. Well, sure. As a detective sitting at your desk, you're going to look into that. But you're still going to follow many other leads that are coming in or, or what you think. But the duct tape and the chair and the chain hoist, that's great evidence, okay? You have to look at, okay, let's, let's show a picture of this chain hoist. Let's show a picture of the chair. The chair is what would be important to me as an investigator. And in this instance, I don't think that, I'm sure it was looked at and maybe it went nowhere. But for me, I'd be like, okay, any suspects that we have, we're going to look who has a matching set of these chairs and go from there. If somebody has five dining room chairs and now they have four and they're of the same make, hey, that's a good lead, right? That's something you want to follow up on. Well, they did show the chair and they showed that to the public and somebody came forward and said, hey, that chain hoist was mine and I left it at a former residence when I left. And guess who lives in that residence? Yes, Joe and Shannon Argofsky. So now things are starting to look good towards these guys. They get interviewed. They say parents, or the mom at least, says, hey, he was home all day. It's a solid alibi. Both of them have alibis. Okay, we move on to other suspects. They got alibis, right? Alibi is what you need. So they test the duct tape, you know, and they, they come to find out that the whole roll of duct tape was used in wrapping Dan Short to this chair. And I believe that comes out to like 60 feet of duct tape. The forensic unit at the FBI is able to match up every single piece of duct tape. Now by that, what do I mean? Where you tear the duct tape, they under microscopic uh, um, means, they're able to match up where it was torn at. So that way you can determine whether it comes from the same roll. And in this case, they all had, except they were missing one piece. There was no fingerprints on any of this duct tape. So they got nowhere to go. They come to realize, and by they I'm saying investigators, that these brothers had 45 caliber handguns. And they were confiscated and I think they were giving, given over consensual. Uh, the brothers allowed the FBI or the law enforcement that had jurisdiction to test those with the shell casings that were found at the bank and guess what? No, you're wrong. They don't match. So they have alibis. The weapons don't match. So what? They're bragging around town that they have lots of money and they're spending some money and they don't have jobs. Maybe they're just drug dealers. Okay. Apparently their dad had passed away and they were given a trust fund. And so they were getting money from that. 
So it doesn't mean that they're bank robbers and it sure doesn't mean that they are suspects in this murder. However, a day or two after the body was found, a concerned citizen was watching out his window at all the activity that was happening on this bridge. He decides after they leave to go down on the shoreline and do some investigating himself. What does he find? That's right, a piece of duct tape that had washed ashore. Now what's the chances of that? I don't know, but it happened. And when he turned that duct tape over to police and the FBI and they ran that in their lab, not only did they find that that was the missing piece in the 60 feet of duct tape, it had fingerprints on it. Now, when I originally researched this, I thought to myself, maybe it's a skeptic in me. Maybe it's my, I won't say distrust in the government. Again, uh, I would be a fool to say Police never planted evidence in their life. Hey, I'm a realist. I know that shit happens. I've never seen it happen in my 15 year law enforcement career. But it has been proven in a court of law that it does occur. How could no fingerprints be found on, let's say, 55 feet of duct tape. But the one missing piece shows up a day later with fingerprints on it. Coincidental. Makes you kind of like, mm, okay. When they ran the fingerprints through the, I believe it's the, APHIS system, it's been a while, I almost said CODIS. A CODIS is for DNA. APHIS, I believe, was uh, for fingerprints. It came back, no match. So, whoever it was, their fingerprints were not on file. They would go back to their two suspects, and there was more than these two suspects, okay? But they go back to these brothers, and Joe voluntarily gives his fingerprints. It's not a match. However, the examiner says it's similar. And if he had a brother, he certainly would like to see those prints. Well, Shannon, the younger brother, who I believe was 18 at the time, Joe was 23, Shannon refuses to give his prints. Now, why does he do this? Does he do it because that's his constitutional right? Or does he do it because he knows that those are his fingerprints on there? Well, if you were to guess the former instead of the latter, you would be correct. Or maybe if you were to guess the latter instead of the former, you would be correct. His fingerprints were on there. They had to get a court order to obtain those fingerprints. Now, what is that? Uh, sometimes, you know, you'll come across people that won't give you their DNA and you can't forcefully just go and take it. You can obtain their fingerprints without their knowledge and their DNA without their knowledge. Or if you have probable cause or reasonable suspicion, I believe in the federal level, uh, you can certainly get a court order or a search warrant to obtain such. I believe I had to do that for DNA from an individual who would not give me DNA in a cold case murder that I was working. And all I did is I went to the judge and wrote out an affidavit. This is why I believe it's possible, you know, that he is involved in this crime. I need his DNA and I got a search warrant for his DNA. They got a court order in this case. So, and each state is different. So I'm originally thinking a court order is because of the FBI being involved. 
because for me it would be a search warrant but regardless they got it and guess what it's a match so I start thinking how does his fingerprints only end up in that one section that was found on shore and not of the 50 what plus feet of tape that was binding the victim to the chair well I've used duct tape plenty of times you start to roll it's everything's easy and you're tearing it off I can see with gloves it's harder you're in a stress induced situation you're about ready to kill somebody more than likely you've never killed before you're in a hurry you're duct taping him maybe you just maybe the tape itself went flat up against the rest of the roll you know how that happens how anno um, annoying that is when your tape goes flat and there's not a little flap to catch it and if you have gloves on you can't get that no matter how hard you try imagine being in a panic it's simply much easier to take that glove off get your fingernails in there and get the piece of tape off and I think that's what happened so although the crime seems to be very planned out there was a mistake so no matter how much I lean or looked at that this piece of tape possibly could be planted no there's no planning how, well, how would they plan it okay they would have to get a piece of tape from the exact same roll that was used on that individual to wrap him up into that chair and then you somehow have to get Shannon Argofsky's fingerprints which remember are not on file so you would have to take his live hand and put it on this duct tape no it didn't happen what happened was when they were throwing him over the bridge one of the spindles broke on the chair where his ankle was taped to and that broke off so there were some splintered pieces of wood also on that duct tape and that's how it became loose and drifted off and ended up on the shore wow what luck for those investigators right i wish i had that luck in a couple of my cases that i've worked you know how many times i've came out and i'm like i'd look up to the sky i'm like <laughs> give me something here help me out because i know how frustrating it is you get these good leads and you follow it and you think this is it and then it disappoints you then you're back up and you're back down so this had to be so rewarding and fulfilling for these investigators so they are able to take to trial three years later the brothers they are both found guilty of the bank robbery then they are tried again for the murder the older brother Joe his trial ended in a mistrial prosecutors chose not to retry him because he had already gotten a life sentence for that bank robbery Shannon was found guilty of the murder and he's doing a life sentence and a little side note is he killed an inmate with his bare hands and beat him to death in prison so he got another sentence for that not a lot of evidence you know but a lot of the evidence is backtracking okay you got his fingerprints very good evidence but let's okay now that they're suspects let's start looking at their spending habits and that's what these investigators did and they found out that although they didn't have jobs they paid for like a Disney vacation in cash um, some repair work in cash in itself that's not unusual right I pay for a lot of stuff in cash but you add the fingerprints you add them boasting around town Shannon saying he was the richest teenager in Knoll the mother who remember gave them this salad al alibi 
they her van was brown and it matched the van that was seen on the bridge in addition joe had a blue pickup truck and it was seen by a truck driver leaving that bridge it was seen in the area recently as if you know it was in the area staking out because you gotta remember they didn't know that these people were from that area it could have been somebody an outsider you, you know that's the only two possibilities right it's somebody from that town or it's somebody passing through so they were certainly suspects and for good reason now while in jail Shannon had confessed to doing this or alluding to it to a couple prison inmates now confessions to prison inmates and using them at trial is always very tricky for prosecutors because you know the defense is going to attack their credibility is there a deal you know why are you testifying what are you getting out of it and make no mistake the informants are always getting something out of it although they always say they're not there's always something in a former they wouldn't do it unless they really hated the person and didn't care about repercussions but you tie all of this together and although I don't think it was a slam-dunk case by any means the right people are behind jail for this heinous I can't stress that enough can, can just close your eyes for a minute and imagine in the middle of the night you being duct taped to a chair and then a cinder block and a chain hoist intertwined in this chair and you're getting lifted up and down you know who knows how far in the pitch black night in that cold ass water and they push you over you can only imagine the fear in that victim <sighs> that's brutal that's brutal why not just shoot them right that, I, that's the part I don't get you have a weapon you shot the security camera. Why duct tape him to a chair and drown him? Throw him off a bridge alive. Why not just shoot him in the head? Leave him lay. Shoot him in the head. Throw him in. I guess only the two brothers know the answer to that. To me, that goes to show the mindset of these two individuals to be that cruel listen I get committing crimes I get it people on hard times they steal when people are hungry they steal now you have the flip side of that people that are lazy people that are greedy they steal also that's what these guys were okay they could live off a trust fund but when that money dries out which this did they had to rob a bank do I particularly have anything against bank robbers not really you know are they hurting anybody yes no hey listen prostitution is a crime okay are they hurting anybody no but there are rules there are laws in place you know that it's against the law and you choose to do it so to me I don't have empathy for you you committed a crime you robbed the bank you know oh well you get caught but to do this to drown somebody and throw them off a bridge alive when you could there's a hundred other ways you could kill somebody the most simplest being shoot them and leave them there but for some reason I can't get this out of my mind you duct tape the victim to a chair and throw him in the water and drown them 
For no reason. What's the reason? They're not smart enough to think, well, if we throw it in the water, it's going to get rid of all forensic evidence that could be there. No, they're not, they're not that smart. You see that he took off his glove while he was wrapping them up and left his fingerprints on there. They're not that smart that they carried 320 pounds of coins out of that bank. So, I guess, you know, what I want to take away from this case is how good forensics can work for you, how lucky sometimes you have to be to solve a case. You could have all the skill in the world, but sometimes you'll take that little piece of luck. That's what happened here. But those two things, that's not what I take from this crime or this case. It's the brutality. Again, if you go back and watch my other videos, you'll know I am the type of investigator who always wants to know why. It's great that you solved the case. It's great that you connected Ted Bundy to Kimberly Leach's murder, okay? It's great that you connected him to the Chi Omega murders. I want to know why he chose that oak log to beat them with when he wasn't going there with a weapon. It was a weapon of opportunity. Why did you choose to pick that up before entering the house? Fast forward to this case. I want to know why you duct taped this innocent victim. I would be very curious to know, and I haven't heard this, and I'm sure I would have, but it would explain it if that bank manager turned them down for a loan. Right? Then you have the anger come out. Then I can, as an investigator, not as a human being, as an investigator, I can understand why you would duct tape and drown this person alive and throw him off a bridge. As horrible as that is, as an investigator, I can shake my head then and say, okay, now I know why you didn't just want to shoot him. You were angry. You had to torture him. He had to feel pain like you felt it because you got rejected for a loan. But absence of that, if they didn't get rejected, if Dan did not know these brothers, I don't understand why you would do that to another human being. I mean, yeah, you can ask that about anybody that kills anybody. How can you do that to another? I get it. But this is unusually cruel to do. You go to the bank manager, bank president's house. You had talked about this, about doing it, and now you're implementing the action. You go, I'm trying to think why you have to kill him, right? Usually when there's no connection uh, and you're trying to figure out why, why murder? You could simply rob the bank, right? And not have to hurt anybody. That happens all the time. But in this case, they take him by force to the bank, force him to open it up, open up the vault. I guess if, they're, if they don't know each other, it's just like any other case where a crime like that's committed and you don't want to leave any witnesses. Hey, we spent a good hour, two hours with this guy robbing the bank, going to his house, ransacking his house, throwing all these things. Um, he could identify us. So we're going to kill him. Simple as that. But you shoot him. You don't duct tape him and throw him in a river. I don't get that part. That's what I'll take away from this case. Is the sheer brutality of what they did. All right, let me go over my notes here on this case and see if there's anything else that I missed that I wrote down. That the brothers discussed it before and after the, uh, the crime. 
They were seen on the bridge, at least the van was. Another thing that I failed to mention is a witness came forward and said they saw the brothers loading their weapons and while they were doing so, they were wiping the bullets clean of fingerprints. Now, isn't that ironic? Because they were smart enough to do that, but yet fingerprint evidence is what ended up convicting them on the duct tape. It's just ironic. So, a question I had is, okay, they confiscated their 45s. Ballistics did not match the shell casings in the bank. So, where was, where was that weapon? Probably at the bottom of that river. That that's, would be my guess. Um, and I don't have an answer for that. Maybe the prosecution does. I just haven't seen that. I'd want to know that as well. I'm kind of curious about the fingerprints. You know, I watched an interview with the examiner and he said, you know, Joe's fingerprints were similar. I never heard that before. Never heard that. That fingerprints are similar, you know, to a brother, to a relative. I didn't know that. If that's true, and I'm going to assume it is because, I mean, this guy, it was an expert. You know, I'm not an expert on fingerprints. I've been to, you know, many fingerprint school and I've lifted many latent prints from crime scenes. But I, I never knew that they could be similar to a relative. Now, DNA, I have come across that. I had a, I had some touch DNA on a victim's underwear that were pulled off of her during a rape murder. It was not a full DNA profile, it was a partial. That partial m matched minus one from one of my suspects. And I talked to a DNA expert and he told me, if it's not a match, it's not a match. You know, it doesn't matter that it's off by one. It's not a match. However, if he had a twin brother, it would be interesting. Well, guess what? He did have a twin brother. So, I equate that to this being similar. That DNA was similar. Fingerprint being similar. I just found that very odd. Uh, that's it. That's all for this case. Uh, this is a good case because it had a conclusion. Okay. A lot of the cases that I cover on this channel don't. Just think of that fingerprint on that. Let's say the, the tape, the missing duct tape did show up on the shore, but there was no fingerprint on it. There's no case. These two brothers would have gotten away with it, right? Because if you go to court nowadays with this evidence, no fingerprint, and just some bank records and this and that, very purely circumstantial, you're not getting a conviction. I'm here to tell you. Not, not nowadays. But they had that fingerprint match. And the right people were arrested. And they've never admitted to it. Okay. I believe Shannon is the one who, when he had a chance to speak at the end of his conviction, rambled on a lot about being, uh, they got the wrong person and this and that. But you can't explain away the fingerprints on the sticky side, the adhesive side of that tape. Now, there was another case that this has happened to. This is not the first time that fingerprints were found on the sticky side of a tape. So I just find that very compelling evidence to me. I can't think of a way that it would be planted or why it would... I mean, there's obviously conspiracists out there that could come up with a way that this was planted evidence. They snuck into Shannon's house at night and they had duct tape with him and they put it to his fingers while he was sleeping and snuck out. I'm telling you, there's people that think that way. 
Okay? They think everything is James Bond 007 conspiracy. I don't buy it. So, that's all I got, I guess, for this case. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. So, until next time, hey, Maine's out. Oh, fear of